So let me begin by uh, apologizing for the fact that I'm going to speak in English. Uh, my Russian is non-existent, uh, and I feel very badly that I'm doing this in English uh, as opposed to being able to uh, uh, share this with you in, 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 uh, in Russian. I hope that you will stop me if something that I say is, uh, is unclear. Uh, and I hope you will, as I said, for, forgive me for proceeding in English. Um, as, as Oleg said, I'm going to talk about my own experience, but let me just take one minute to build on something that Oleg said. You know, education in higher education in the United States encompasses an enormous amount of diversity. We have more than 3,000 institutions that offer bachelor's degrees, that offer BAs, which is our degree, our first degree for students who are, who are usually about 22. Um, within that, we have an enormous diversity of size. So we have both very small institutions, institutions where you will have only BA students, maybe as small as 1,000 students, to institutions that are very, very large. Only I've mentioned UCLA, which has 40 to 50,000 students. We have, we have schools that are only colleges, only BAs, nothing else. We have large research universities. We have schools that have really very little financial uh, uh, ability, very little wealth. Schools that have a great deal of wealth. We've talked a little bit about public institutions, which in the United States means on a, on a state level as opposed to on a national level. And we've talked about uh, private universities. Uh, we have schools that are extremely selective. They will take five students out of 100 who apply. And schools where anybody who comes, they will be accepted. And we have schools that are very centralized, schools where the president or, or so the president for us is the, the equivalent, I think, of a rector, where the president will run really much of what happens, and schools that are extremely not centralized, that are very decentralized, where there, are, there is great power in the individual components of the institution. Um, I come from, my, I've worked for many years at Harvard and at Tufts University, uh, both universities in, uh, in, in Massachusetts, uh, near Boston. Um, they are both research universities, so they offer college degrees, but also many other kinds of schools, schools of government, uh, medical schools, uh, uh, law school, a whole variety of different kinds of degrees uh, and academic degrees, PhDs also. Um, they are both relatively wealthy by American standards, although Harvard is much wealthier. They're both private, they're both very selective, and they're both, and this is actually very important, they're both quite decentralized. They're both schools where the deans, Oleg talked a little about the dean in the US model, where the deans actually have a great deal of power. The deans manage their own budgets, they manage hiring decisions, they are, they are really like little tiny mini universities in many ways of, of, on their own. So that's, uh, that's the US educational system broadly. But, but shared governance in the US context also has some very distinctive elements. The idea of elections, we were talking before about uh, why Americans are so uh, horrified when they find out that rectors are elected in the German system. Um, the, the, the elected roles are much less common, much less typical that really almost anything will be done by election. And where you have elections, the roles are often more symbolic than, than actual. So in the US system, the trustees and the president have ultimate authority. They, it's, it's, you know, it's very, that's, the authority is vested in the trustees and the president. 
the trustees and the president delegate authority, but they delegate it conditionally. So it's, it, it is the, the trustees, ultimately, who delegate authority to the president. The trustees in the, U, the US system pick the president. And the trustees and the president delegate, give authority to the faculty for a number of different things. So several things are important there. It's authority is given, and it's not given for everything. It's given for very specific things. So in particular, the faculty is generally given great authority over curriculum, what, what is taught and how, over admissions, who is accepted, who, who are they going to teach, and then also for the appointment of faculty. So I've been thinking as we've been talking, and I was thinking about this yesterday as well, about what, what really makes shared governance work. You spoke earlier about philosophy and that the philosophy is different in, in different places. And I think that's really, it's very important that, that there are different elements that make shared governance work. And some of it is in these structures, but not everything. So I would say there are several things that are very important to making shared governance work. The first is, I actually think clarity of roles is extremely important. So is, is the role of the president, the dean, the committee, is it to make a decision? Do they really have the authority to make a decision? Or are they advisory? Either role can be fine, but it's important to be clear about what the roles are. Do you have authority over the academic? Do you have authority over the budget? Again, there are lots of different ways of thinking about it, but it's very important that there's clarity. The other thing I would say is I, I had thought about it in terms of style, the style of how, you, of how you work with people. I think philosophy, as I said, is another good way of thinking about it. But the way you do it matters. So in the systems that, that I know best, so in the private systems, uh, private and I would say um, uh, top quality institutions, the relationships are very collegial. There's a lot of conversation and there's a lot of interaction. It sometimes makes us slow. We don't do things quickly and we are often criticized for that. But it's that, it's the time, it's the, it's the nature of the conversation that actually turns out to be a very important part of making shared governance work. And that's hard because it's not something you can legislate. You know, you can't say to somebody, be friendly or, you know, talk to the other members of your department. It doesn't really work that way, but it actually turns out to be very important. And I think one of the reasons it's very important is that shared governance really ultimately relies on trust. You have to trust as a faculty member, at some point, you have to trust the president, the provost, the dean, the rector. And as the, as the president, provost, dean, rector, you also have to trust that your faculty are going to consider and act in the best interests of the institution. So how do you create that? What do you do to create that style, that philosophy, that, that trust? I think there are a couple of things that you can do. The first is that the processes matter. Oleg talked a little bit about the tenure system in the United States. So as, as I suspect you know, the system in the United States is that people work and after about seven years, seven to 10 years, they are, you, they are evaluated on their work, and they are given tenure, which means a lifetime uh, commitment on the part of the university. It means they're given a lifetime job. And the basis behind this in the US system is a belief that with tenure comes a, a, a freedom, an academic freedom to say things 
that might be controversial or that people might not like, and that it also is a, a way to allow people to explore and to do, uh, to do new things. So the tenure system involves works like this. A faculty, a department, wants to hire somebody. They go to their dean and they say, dean, we want to hire a new person to teach uh, you know, Chinese religions, ancient Chinese religions. The dean says, that's a wonderful idea. You can go do that. The department then works with someone on the dean's staff to define the position, define how they're going to look, and they get into very real detail together and they work it out. So it goes, they go back and forth, the department wants this, the, the dean's representative says to do that. They come to an agreement. The position is put openly, it's, it's posted is the word that we use, but it's, it's advertised openly. It's advertised in lots of different ways. And part of the responsibility of the department is to get many different serious applications. This can't be just a matter of, I'll talk to my friend at, you know, at Yale, and he'll send me his best student. It has to be broader than that. And that's very much a part of the conversation, and the dean's representative will look over how the search is done to make sure that there is a broad enough and a high enough quality pool. The department debates who they want. They pick somebody. They come to the dean. The dean looks at it. And the dean says, OK, you know, I like this. I am now going to pass it on. So it's the department's decision. But the dean has to agree. And then at this point, in, at both the system, in both of the universities that I know best, Tufts and Harvard, there is a process where that hire, where that person is subjected to an outside review. So their colleagues in the field at this point are, are contacted and are said, and they are asked, is this person's work good enough for him or her to be hired by our university. So not only is it, it's not only does it go back and forth between the dean and the department, but it, it is then evaluated outside. And at that point, the president or the provost, it, it differs in different situations, also has to agree. So because these hires are so high stake, because when you hire somebody for a tenured position, you're making really a lifetime bet, they are very open. They're evaluated in lots of different ways. And the goal is the highest level of merit you can find. But the point is there's lots of back and forth. It's ultimately the department's choice to, to begin but they cannot get somebody through the system if they cannot convince the dean and the president that this person is high enough quality. Um, I would also say that the budget process for the universities has much of that in common, too. In the, in the Harvard system, the deans have a great deal of control over their own budgets. They have much of their own funds. They get the tuition, which in the American system is very, you know, very considerable and, and very important. They develop their own budgets, but they develop it talking to the president's budget people. They come to an agreement together, and then the budgets ultimately are, are agreed to, authorized by the president and the trustees. So again, lots of back and forth and lots of different points where things can be changed or stopped by the president, although the authority is really vested in the deans. So why does this work? 
the systems are open, there's a lot of accountability. If lots of people are looking over what you're doing, there's a lot of accountability. And it's done by the highest level colleagues. The people who do these roles, the people who take on these jobs, the people who do these evaluations of, 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 uh, of the hires are extremely well-respected scholars in the community. I think there are a couple of things we can learn from this. Lots of interaction. The president and provost tends not to interfere unless there's really a problem. So the, the bar for interfering is high. There's a knowledge that the president has the authority. Whether or not the president chooses to use it is a different question, but, but it's clear in the system that the authority rests with the president in the end. And there's a knowledge that decisions are going to be reviewed. And when you know somebody's going to look at what you did, it makes people, makes people think about what they're doing in a, in a, uh, it, 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 it makes people tend to do things with a little more effort and a little a higher level, a higher standard. Then the system makes it hard to hide things. It makes it hard to bring in, you know, your best friend's graduate student for the position because you know all of your colleagues are going to look at it, and the president is going to look at it too. Um, I think the other thing that you need to do when you're the president is you need to create lots of opportunities for really authentic discussion and feedback. And there are lots of ways you can do that without giving up authority. Um, I'll, I'll mention just a couple. So, in our system, the choice of a dean is very important. These are, it's a little like choosing a, a rector for a, a, a small school. It's really very important. And at Harvard, because we have 12 schools, and because people tend to stay in the role of dean for somewhere between five and 10 years, just about every year we need to choose another dean. It's, it's just, it's part of the system. It's, it's, I would argue for lots of reasons, it's actually a good thing. Um, when we do a dean search, here's how we do it. The president sets up a committee of people from the school, people from the, the unit where we're looking for a dean. She picks a group, it's a fairly small committee, it's usually about 12 people. She picks faculty who are extremely well respected, which means they're very good scholars, and they're good citizens of the university, and they represent different opinions. So they represent different kinds of ways of looking at, at issues in the field broadly. She picks some people from other parts of the university who are not in that school. So we have a search going on right now for our School of Public Health. And there are three people on the committee from other schools who work, have, have knowledge of the, of the area of public health, but they're not a part of the school. And the committee is advisory. The ultimate decision is the president. She's very clear about that. But she, she takes what they say very seriously. So she reviews all the information with them. <clears throat> they get lots of very confidential information. And the conversations are very serious and very important in her final decision. So again, there's a lot of clarity in the roles. She's really asking the question. This is not, she's not pretending. This is a very serious, she's very seriously interested in what they have to say. And as the leader, she's, she, is, she listens, but she also doesn't let the opinions, you know, she doesn't move every time she hears somebody's opinion. She looks like, 
You know Vladimir Putin better than I do. I will let you make that choice. Um, but that's very typical for us. I'll give you two other uh, quick examples. Um, Oleg talked about NYU. Um, so in 2008, lots of people were saying to Harvard, why aren't you building campuses in other parts of the world? And the president said, well, that's a very good question. And she put, she put together a committee of faculty from across the university and said, please tell me what you think I should do. She did not say, I'm going to do what you tell me. But she did say, please tell me what you think I should do. And the committee debated and came up with a set of recommendations, <clears throat> which in fact, over the last 10 years, we have been starting to implement. Their first recommendation was, we don't want a campus. And while she did not have to listen to them, she brought it to the Board of Trustees. They discussed it. And everybody agreed that this was a very good idea. So another example of a place where we've debated something. Um, an example of something that's not a formal committee, and I would say sometimes informal committees can work very well too, is we've had a lot of um, big debate in the US uh, in the last couple of years around divestment, around uh, um, dealing with the environment, uh, dealing with issues of global warming and climate change, and what are the roles of universities in thinking about this. And many of our students have gotten very upset about this and have you know, done things like last year they took over the office building where the president's office is. So we've had lots of, um, lots of uh, um, to do about that. And the president brought together an informal group of faculty who are very interested in these issues and has asked them for their uh, opinions and advice. So I said, it's not a formal group. They have no formal responsibility, but they have been very helpful to her. Um, I would also say it's very important to recognize that, that, there, that a well-run committee is not, it's not an accident. There are, as we all know, committees that are very well run and committees that are not so well run. And doing the things that make a committee work well really makes a lot of difference. And I would say that includes giving them a real charge, choosing people with d different points of view, but also choosing people who are respected by their colleagues. And that means respected both as, as academics, but also as people who can be counted on to, to be good representatives and good citizens for everybody else. And I think you have to give them a lot of information. I think you, have to, you can't hide things from them. You have to share things with them and say to them, you know, this is confidential information, but it gives them the power to go to their colleagues and say, I can't tell you everything, but the president shared you know, all of this information with us, and therefore, I feel confident about what I'm telling you. Um, we have lots of committees within the schools as well. So we run, we don't have an elected Senate, but we run, each school runs a faculty meeting. In the biggest school, there is a a small group called the Faculty Council. Um, it, has no, uh, it has no formal power. It's actually elected um, and has no actual power, but the dean spends a great deal of time talking with them about issues. Um, and there's also a committee that sets the agenda for the faculty meetings. I should say that the faculty meetings are, in fact, attended by very, very, very few members of the faculty, um, but they do, they do exist. So what makes this internal structure work for us? As I said, I, I think that, well, what are the internal structures, rather? What are the kinds of structures that make it work? Again, I would say I think style is more important than the exact structures. But uh, at Harvard, the president has what she calls the Council of Deans. So we have 12 schools, those deans, and a few of the most important sub-deans meet every month. It's a small group. There are about 15 to 17 people in it. 
There is a lot of trust between the different members. They've spent a lot of time together. They've debated a lot of issues. There's a collegiality. Um, it can move quickly when it has to. It has real authority. These are people in the room who have real authority and therefore can really make decisions and choices. And they have budgets, that's right. They have budgets, they, they have budgets, they have people who work for them, they have independence. Um, and the committee is given a lot of very high level attention. Um, I actually spend um, a significant portion of my time working with the president on what we're going to do when that committee meets. It's, this is not taken, uh, it, it's not taken casually. We put together the agendas, we spend a fair amount of time talking about it, uh, but the president and I do, but also I speak with the deans about it, and it's, it is, it's a very, taken very seriously. I also think you need to communicate beyond those management groups, those small groups. And when people say communicate, I think a lot of the time they think, oh, we'll send out a newsletter. And newsletters are actually very important. We put a lot of effort into those kinds of communications. But I think beyond formal communications, there are lots of informal ways, and I think Presidents and provosts and deans are very, very busy, and it's very easy to say, I don't have time to, to do this, but in fact, the, the, the lunch that you have with faculty, the dinner, the committee meeting, actually makes a lot of difference in that communication. And at Harvard, it's an expectation that the president not only does that herself, but it's something that she expects of her deans, the, that informal communication, and of her senior staff. There's a great deal you get out of sitting down with somebody and just having an informal conversation where they tell you all the things that you're doing wrong. Um, you can really learn a lot from having people talk to you about those things. I think there's some other things that you can do. I actually think training is very important. And this has not been something we've had a big tradition of in the United States, the idea that you trained people for uh, these academic roles, these roles of academic leadership, was never something that you did in the United States. You just sort of put somebody in the position and they were sort of like, well, there, you can do this job. Now you have the title, do the job. But we've really actually started to change that. Most of us do it, most of the universities do it individually. Um, we have this year at Harvard two new deans, and we will run a two-day seminar just for those two deans. And the people who will be there will be not only the president and the provost, but, but many very, very senior people. So again, we take it seriously. We put a lot of time into it. And people at the highest levels participate in this. We do a very similar thing for very high potential faculty, people that we believe can take on leadership roles. We do a kind of training for them as well. It's, it's very similar. Small, high level attention, people take it very seriously. So I think one of the changes that, one of the questions rather, that, that I heard asked after Oleg talked, it's very important. How do you actually make changes? All of this sounds good, but what can you really do to make it work? And I think the answer is, of course, it's going to be different in different institutions. Institutions have different cultures. That, that's, that's natural. But I think a very common thread is uh, leadership. And when I say leadership, I don't mean one person. I, I think one person can have an influence, but it's not the only answer. I think it's got to be a leader and then other people working with them. So I would say, you know, for, for the president at Harvard, she can make changes with the support of her deans, and the deans need their own support within their school. And I think that that's ultimately an, an, a perfect illustration of shared governance when it's working well. 
And I, I think one of the reasons why uh, Oleg and I believe shared governance is, is an important thing to think about and talk about is certainly in the United States, functioning shared governance, good, healthy shared governance, is very closely associated with the top quality universities. Um, Oleg talked earlier about, about this question of, um, of making faculty feel like they're owners of the university. And I would say that's actually very important. And if you think about it, why does it help? Well, you know, shared governance gives people a mutual accountability. The president actually is accountable to the board of trustees, but she also feels accountable to the faculty. And the faculty, in turn, feel accountable to their colleagues and to their deans. I think when you have trust, it means you can insist on certain processes. We make everybody go through this very time-consuming, very labor-intensive tenure process, partially because it builds trust in what happens, and people trust the process itself. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle. Um, and you know, when people feel like they own the institution, it's part of how you attract top quality people, and really good people like to be with really good colleagues. One of the reasons people put so much time, again, into the tenure process is because our faculty believe that they look better when their colleagues are also top quality. They don't want to be the one good person in a really bad department. They feel that makes them look bad. And they would rather have the woman sitting next to them be absolutely the best person in her field and feel like they get some of the benefit from that, too. Um, I think it's especially important in hiring, and it's very important in evaluation. So again, openness and accountability in hiring. It's a balance between the subject expertise of the faculty and the institutional perspective of the deans, the provost, the president. If a search isn't run well, if the president looks at a search and says, what happened here? How did you get to this decision? You have to reject it. It's a message, and it sends credibility throughout every search that happens when you do that. Um, we talked a little bit about evaluation. I think evaluation needs to be done at all levels. So our, unlike our faculty who have lifetime contracts, our president and our deans are, have five-year appointments. And every five years, they are evaluated in a very formal process. It's done in different ways at different institutions. At Tufts, uh, Tufts appoints a committee to do it. At Harvard, we usually bring in somebody from the outside with expertise. But the evaluations are very serious and are the president discusses it with the dean, the board of trustees discusses it with the president. And because it's done on that level, Every, it's very, it becomes very hard to say, well, I shouldn't be evaluated, right? The president can be evaluated, but I'm more special than the president. People don't do that. They, they understand evaluation is part of it. And we do outside reviews of departments and programs every five or so, every five to seven years as well. Um, it's, a different, it's a different issue for us with the faculty. The evaluation is more rigorous at the entry point in the system that I know exists in Russia where you don't do tenure, I, I would completely agree that you want to do serious evaluations of some kind with very open criteria. The criteria need to be very clear. The criteria can't just be, we're tired of you. The criteria have to be, you know, whatever they are, publications, teaching quality, whatever it is, but very, very open criteria. And the reviews should happen. I, I'm completely in agreement with that. I would actually say other things that matter are term limits for leadership. I don't think anybody should be dean for life. Nobody should be president for life. I think what those term limits are varies from institution. As I said, in our world, 
In my world, you know, the president has five-year terms. Sometimes people serve for 15, 20 years, but typically now in the US, a president will serve for 10 years. Again, different cultures, it's different, but I think limits are important. And our trustees have term limits as well. So the trustees are appointed for some number of years, and there's a limit to how long they can serve. At Harvard's case, it's um, 10 years. Um, I also think non-financial rewards are very important for faculty. We were talking before about financial rewards for publishing in English. I think those are very important, or publishing, excuse me, in international journals. I think that's important, but I think what's really important turns out often to be non-financial rewards. So in Harvard's world, our faculty are paid pretty well. Our faculty, though, get very excited when the president mentions their work in some kind of a speech. So if the president is talking and says, let me tell you about the work of Professor McElroy on the environment and climate change in China, that, that, that makes Professor McElroy extremely happy. There are also, it's true, there are also social rewards. You know, the president gives a dinner party and she invites, uh, she invites, you know, the professor who has just won a particularly prestigious book prize. That actually turns out also to be very important because the faculty member goes back and the next day says to his department, well, as I said to the president last night over dinner, this is actually very important to our faculty. They really care about this. And then the best assignments. So we recently had a big debate in the US about um, ratings for colleges within the United States. So this was a system that uh, the president, uh, President Obama, wanted to put in. And uh, we had some real, at Harvard, had some real concerns about some of the things that we were seeing the Secretary of Education, that's the equivalent, I think, of the Minister of Education here, came to Harvard and wanted to hear what we had to say. And we put together a small group of faculty. The president chose the people herself. This was a very big deal for people. And this was also another kind of reward. They were very good scholars, good citizens, no money, but another very good way of making people feel like being a really top quality scholar and participant in the university was very important. So I'm gonna say just a couple of other things. The first thing I'm gonna say is having said all of this, I, I really wanna be clear about something. The United States is not higher education paradise. We, it's not, I mean, we have a whole set of our own issues. I suspect some of them you will have sympathy with. You know, the trustees. Trustees are very important in our system, as they are, I know, in yours as well, but they're very important in our system. They are, in many ways, really the owners, the actual owners of the institutions. Many of our trustees are business people. That's a wonderful thing. Business people do lots of good things, especially at private universities but they don't come from an academic culture, and often they believe that what's true in business should be true in an academic culture as well. They get very impatient with us. That can be very good, because sometimes we're very slow, but sometimes it's also a matter of not appreciating the values that are important to us. In the state schools, in the public universities in the United States, the trustees are often, not always, but often, political appointments, uh, and therefore will change, the, the, what the trustees believe in will change with different, uh, different people in charge of the government. And the universities are sometimes used as um, political, as places to have political debates. So there's been a very famous case in the United States where the president of the University of Texas at Austin probably one, uh, probably the top, or certainly one of the top three research universities in the United States, 
um, was targeted by a member of the Texas legislature. It's a very conservative body in Texas. And was harassed to such a level about his decisions by this one member of the legislature that uh, he ultimately had to hire an additional staff person just to answer this man's requests for documents and uh, uh, different decisions. He asked to see every um, expense report that the president personally had ever filed. So this had nothing to do with the president, who was a very honest man, but a great deal to do with the president's, with the politics of the president of the university and with the politics of this other person. So this is not, you know, this is not ideal. Um, we talked a little bit about adjuncts. You know, I know that's an issue that uh, the people who are not, don't have full appointments in the university. Um, that's a real issue. It's become more and more common in the United States to have people who aren't really full employees of the university, but who teach one or two courses here and one or two courses there. Um, it's still not true, again, at the larger and the best universities, but it is becoming more common. There are lots of reasons why. We could have a whole separate conversation about what doesn't work about tenure. Um, but there are lots of good reasons why that's happening in the US, but it means these people don't have the same commitment to the university as people who are, <clears throat> excuse me, full-time employees. So those are just a couple of the kinds of things that I would say are issues. But I think, you know, progress can be made on these things and you need to, we need to have these fights in the United States as well. So just to summarize, I would just make a couple of points. Formal systems, Formal structures aren't enough. The informal structures really matter. Building trust requires that you're clear and it requires that you're as open as you can possibly be. It takes a lot of time. You know, the NYU story is a very good example of that. The real problem there was, was that, that uh, the president of NYU wanted what he wanted and he went ahead and he did it and he did it without building support for what he was doing. I think training can really help. Mutual accountability, the president is accountable to the faculty, the faculty are accountable to the president, is important. And I think you need to balance, in Russia's case, balance the history and the culture of Russia and of Russian universities with your ambitions to build. And I think the fact that these discussions are taking place and that, that Russian universities are willing to ask these questions, I think is actually a very good sign for the future. So thank you.